Hello out there in Radio Land. <clears throat> this is Michael. This is the Street Preacher's Corner Podcast. The podcast where we are not afraid to say, I don't know. We're not afraid to say, I'm sorry. And we're not afraid to say, ah, there's a giant tarantula in your head. He's going to kill us all. Well, here at the corner, before we get into our Bible study that we're going to call Mark 14, I want to once again read to you an excerpt from a book by Thomas Watson, written in 1669, called The Christian Soldier or Heaven Taken by Violence. And so in the book, as I've talked about this book before, it's an extraordinary book. Um, he talks about violence in the sense not that you're getting a fist fight, but violence in that you're ext- you extending yourself, you're uh, exerting an effort uh, to do all you can for Jesus Christ, do all you can for the cause of Christ. And... Uh, and I want to read you from a, a section called Reproof to Those Not Putting Forth Holy Violence. I'm just going to read you the first one, I think. It says, out of this text, well, he, he starts the, the, the text off with Matthew eleven twelve, The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force, uh, which is uh, not the version of the Bible he was using in 1669. I would almost guarantee it. But anyway. Out of this text, I may draw forth several errors of reproof towards those that are opposed to holy violence. Number one, it reproves, violence does, it reproves slothful professors who are settled on their lees. They make a lazy profession of piety but use no violence. They are like the lilies, which neither toil nor do they spin. The snail, by reason of its slow motion, was recommended among the unclean in Leviticus 11, verse 30. St. Augustine calls the burial, uh, idolus, the burial of a man while still alive. There are some faint wishes. Oh, that I had heaven. But a man may desire venison and lack it if he does not hunt for it. The sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. Proverbs 13, 4. Men would be content to have the kingdom of heaven, but they are loath to fight for it. They choose rather to go in a feather bed to hell than to be carried to heaven in a fiery chariot of zeal. And violence. How many sleep away and play away their time as if we're made like the Leviathan to play in the sea? Uh, Psalm uh, 105, 26. It is a saying of Seneca, no man is made wise by chance. Sure it is, no man is saved by chance, but he must know how he came by it, namely by offering violence. Such as have accustomed themselves to an idle, lazy disposition will find hard to shake off. I have taken off my robe, must I put it on again? I have washed my feet, must I soil them again? Song of Solomon's 5, verse 3. The spouse had laid herself upon the bed of sloth, and though Christ knocked at the door, she was reluctant to rise and let him in. Some pretend to be believers, but are idle in the vineyard. They pretend to make use of faith for seeing, but not for working. This is faith of fancy. Oh, the Christians had a spirit of activity in them. First Chronicles uh, twenty two sixteen says, Arise and be doing, and the Lord be with you. We may sometimes learn of our enemy. The devil is never idle. He walks about, according to 1 Peter 5, 8. The world is his diocese, and he in every day going on his visitation. Is Satan active? Is the enemy upon his march coming against us? And are we asleep on our guard? And as Satan himself is not idle, so he will not endure that any of his servants should be idle. When the devil had entered into Judas, how active was Judas? He goes to the high priest from midst the band of soldiers and with them back to the garden and never left. Until he betrayed Christ, Satan will not endure an idle servant. And do we think God will? How will the heathen rise up in judgment against slothful Christians? What pains do they take in the Olympian games? They run for a garland of flowers. And do we stand still who run for a crown of immortality? Certainly, if only the violent take heaven, the idle person will never come there. God puts no difference between these two slothful and wicked men. In Matthew twenty-five twenty-six, when he says, Thou wicked... And slothful servant. So there's that. <clears throat> hey, what, what do you say after that? Really, what do you what do you say? I want to go crawl to hold and cry. What do you say? Matthew fourteen. Well, well, well. Dear listener, we have, despite all odds, reached the second chapter of Matthew. Hooray, hooray. So much progress. And at this rate, uh, we should be done with Mark, the book of Mark. Uh, let's see, uh, 13 cha- or 16 chapters, and there are 13, took us 13 lessons to get through the first 45 verses. 
So I'm going to say we're going to get done with the book of Mark in about 208 installments. Yeah. Mark 2, verse 1. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. So he goes back to Capernaum. Now, it's worth noting that between the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2, a couple of things happened that aren't mentioned in Mark. So we're going to look at them. And I, I, let me just go ahead and pre- premise this. If you try to lay out a, a timeline of the life of Christ, and we've mentioned this before, there are some things that are mentioned in certain Gospels. There are certain things that are mentioned in other Gospels. There are certain things that are mentioned in a different order in some Gospels than in other, other Gospels. And some of that you can just sort of sort out, and you can kind of piece through it, and you can tiptoe through it. And in some of it, you just, I, I'll, I won't say you, I'll say I, I cannot sort it out. As far as the exact timeline and the exact uh, order in which things happen, sometimes it's it's hard to it's hard to piece together, and we're going to see a little bit of that here, and we're just going to acknowledge it and keep going. So in uh, Matthew eight, holding your place in Mark, if you're actually holding your place in anything, I don't know what people do. I assume, and and I, and I speak as if we're all sitting in a room together, and you've got a Bible and I've got a Bible, but I don't know what's I don't know what you're doing. So I talk as if you have a Bible in front of you, and maybe you do, maybe you don't, I don't know. So in Matthew 8, uh, 8.18 picks up where uh, Matthew one forty five stops. And it says, Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart into the other side. And a certain scribe said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Excuse me. And... Uh, Yeah, we're going to read the whole thing. And a certain scribe came and said to him, Master, I will follow thee with the ghost. Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, and the birds there have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said to him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Now, I don't, I'm not 100% sure who these guys are. He mentions two guys, a certain scribe that came to him and referred to him as Master. So this was a scribe who had, who had become a disciple. And then you have another fellow who says, in uh, verse 1, another of his, they're not named. They're not mentioned in the gospel, so I, I, I got nothing to I got nothing to work with. Um. So he says, "Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father." But Jesus said to him, "Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead." Now, sometimes we've shown this before with Peter and with Simon and with James and John, uh, how um, it, Jesus will say something to someone that seems rather abrupt, and then and then their their response seems rather abrupt, and that's because you don't have the entire conversation, uh, well, you probably don't have the entire conversation recorded anywhere, but you definitely don't have the entire conversation recorded in that one gospel. And if you compare all the gospels, you can put together a little bit more of a conversation. And and we've seen that in pa- past studies uh, where um, you think the first time that Jesus spoke to somebody, that was not the first time he spoke to them. He got He'd spoke to them before. This was the second or third time that he had met them when he finally said, follow me. Well, we don't we don't have that sort of background with these two fellows here, and so I, I'm willing to admit to you that Jesus's comment, "Follow me and let the dead bury their dead," seems a little brusque and it seems a little uh, uh, a little harsh. But this is all you have to go with. All you have to go by when you look at this sort of thing is Jesus's general character, uh, not only as recorded in Scripture, but as you've experienced him yourself in your Christian life. And so we know from our own Walk and from uh, and from other has revealed in Scripture that Jesus is not brusque and he's not unfeeling. The Bible says we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. We know that he has compassion on us. We know that his his life is marked by compassion. So when he says this fellow, follow me and let the dead bury their dead, I'm assuming, and this guy is a disciple. I'm assuming this is the tail end of a of, of a conversation. Uh, and if you had the whole conversation, maybe you would get a little more insight into what that is. But without that conversation, without that context, I'm very reluctant uh, to comment very much more on it. Uh, verse, uh, let's see, verse 22, 20, uh, Jesus said, follow me and let the bear, lead bear there. Verse 23, and he was entered into a ship. His disciples followed him. And the, behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. You go to Mark, it says he was asleep on a pillow. So just, you know, one of those little details. Now, um, there, there is a, uh, well, okay, so disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said to them, why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? 
Now, there's a great little study you can do if you want to do this, uh, that you can look at all the attributes that Jesus Christ assigns to people that are of little faith. And uh, it's quite a study, and it, re- it reveals, uh, maybe I'll do it. I've got the notes for it. I just haven't, I just haven't put it out on the Internet um, thing. But uh, what you find out is that people that have little faith uh, are a mess. And here you can see that people, that Jesus uh, gives them the attribute of, of having very little faith. And he said the source of their fear is their lack of faith. Um, so here's the situation. I'm of two minds on this. Okay, and, and, and I'm, a, I'm a sailor. I spent literally uh, years uh, on the ocean. And um, I've gone through storms, and I've gone through typhoons, and I've gone through uh, uh, the Tasmanian Bight, which is a little section of, of ocean between Australia and Tasmania, well, which is Australia. Tasmania is also Australia. And they get really upset when you indicate when you sort of slip up and indicate that they're not. But anyway, if you go between those two land masses, one of which is the continent of Australia, one of which is the island of Tasmania, uh, there's a thing called the Tasmanian Bight, and it's it's pretty rough seas. And we've gone up the uh, the uh, um, uh, well, there's a river that goes through Portland, Oregon, uh, uh, the Columbia River, maybe, and that is super rough seas. And we're going through a typhoon off the coast of Pakistan. So I've been in some rough seas, and I've been uh, in rough seas. Where the, the the ship tilts, you know, sideways, not quite sideways, but it is 20, 30 degree rolls, and you get you have waves coming up, and you have waves get into the stack, and and I, I've gone out there and opened one of the weather decks uh, doors and looked out and saw just a wall of water coming my way, and so I just closed it and dogged the hatch. So let me say, in the defense of these disciples, if you've got water coming over the top of the boat, it gets your attention, because uh, you know people don't really belong out in the middle of water. We're not really built for it. We built these little boats so we can go out and go places that we weren't built to go naturally. But, uh, yeah. But so these guys had had fear because of their lack of faith. And if we said before, real faith uh, has to be based on evidence. And the evidence these guys should have been looking at is um, they should have been considering a Psalm 65. Let's look at Psalm 65. I mean, if they believed what they said they believed... They believed that Jesus Christ was God's son. They believed he was God manifest in the flesh. Then all the attributes of God in the Old Testament, he would have he would have had those same he had those same attributes, and they should have acknowledged and understood that he had those attributes. And one of those attributes is or several of those attributes is laid out in Psalm sixty five, starting in verse five. By terrible things in righteousness will thou answer us, O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth, and of them that are far off upon the sea which by his strength setteth fast the mountains, being girded with power, which stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the people. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so they should have known, uh, based on Psalm 65, that everything's going to be fine. Once again, human beings, we're not known for this. Human beings, we're known for believing something and at the same time not believing it in practice. And uh, I, I know that uh, the Bible says that God's going to take care of me. And I know that the Bible says that God's going to, you know, he is he has taken responsibility for me. I'm his problem. I am his responsibility. And having said all that, I will sometimes worry about things like the light bill or how we're going to put gas in the car. Because at the end of the day, I'm a person. And so these guys are just people. But Jesus kind of gets on them a little bit there. And he call, refers to them as, as having very little faith. But really, what are the odds? I mean, you know, I get it. I wasn't there. And when you're when you're in the middle of it, uh, your reaction to things is sometimes way different uh, than than you think it's going to be. You know, we, we spent all this time in the Navy uh, training to fight shipboard fires uh, because, you know, if the ship catches fire, uh, I mean, there's nobody you can call. So we spent all this time and you, you and this is old school stuff I'm talking about. They got all new stuff now and it's it's way, way better. But we had these little uh, ox, uh, OBAs or uh, oxygen breathing apparatuses. It, it was like a big... Uh, like two big lungs uh, set that was the, the harness you wore. And I don't know why I'm telling this story. I'm going to tell the story anyway. So we, uh, um, and there's like these two big lungs and there's this canister you put in the middle and it's got this tin full or some kind of metal seal on the top. And you put it in this little thing and you drop this little bale. I'm waving my arms around while I'm telling you this, like you could see me. But anyway, so I dropped the bale and it pierces this canister and it releases this chemical that produces oxygen and puts them in these two big leather lung looking things that are sitting on your chest and you're sucking in this chemically made oxygen and it 
tastes terrible and it burns your throat a little bit. But it burns your throat less than the poisonous gas in the room when you go to fight a fire. So anyway, they, they teach you how to put this thing on. You put this mask on. You put there. You put the thing. You drop the bail. You, the lungs fill up. You set this timer. And then this timer starts counting down, you know, and then this timer rings. And go, and then and then you know uh, that it's time to get out of there because you got like five minutes of air left. And so we train this for this and train for this. You do it and you do it and you do it. And, you know, this uh, this OBA thing, uh, uh, the canister, it's a chemical reaction, so it heats up. It heats up, and it, you can feel it warm against your against your like your solar plexus, and uh, and then when you finally when it runs out of air, you you pull this thing and it drops on the floor. You have to be careful not to let it hit you on the way down. You know any of the uh, you know family making equipment there because it's really really hot. Anyway, so so do all this, and you're trained, and you're trained, and train, and 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 you you say okay, you know so the reason you train a man, uh, and so this reason you do things over and over and over again like that is so that when the when everything is going down and, and you're scared and you're tired and you're whatever, your body will do what you've done hundreds and hundreds of times because that's just that's how it that's how it works. You won't think about it. You'll know what to do because you will have play acted this hundreds and hundreds of times. This has lots of application in the ministry. But specifically, I'm saying that when I went through all that, and I'm not a person given to fear, I'm not a person given to uh, that sort of thing, but the first time that the ship caught fire and I put on all this gear, and I dropped the bale, and I had this nasty chemical oxygen fill in my lungs, and I went through the hatch, and I saw that the entire room was on fire. My my physiological reaction was way more uh, fearful than I thought it would be. I was more scared than I thought it was going to be. Every brain cell you have is screaming at you, going, the room is on fire. Why are we going inside the room? The room is on fire. So these guys had been to sea, getting back to the text, these guys had been to sea, you know, all their lives, most of their lives, whatever. They'd probably been through the storms, they'd seen through storms, and they, they might have known or they might have understood intellectually that there's a ship that's got Jesus Christ on is not going to sink. And yet at the same time, when push came to shove, they believed what they saw rather than what they knew. And so, you know, if those... uh. If those shoes fit, by all means, by all means, wear them. Because uh, I think sometimes they fit everybody from time to time. And the older they get, I get and the more of a failure I see myself as, I like to think the more gracious I am with others. Verse 24, And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We perish. Let me just, I'm not going to grind this axe. I am very tempted to grind this axe, but I will not. I will just say this in passing. Verse 25 is the source material for at least one very stupid song that is sung in a lot of churches. And the entire song is predicated on the idea that in your life, your prayer life, in your devotional life to Jesus Christ, the same way these guys have to go wait, had to go wake him up, uh, you have to, by your prayers and by your fervency, you have to wake him up, wake up God somehow, and and get him on board your situation and, 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 and advise him of, uh, of things he already knows. And it, it's just, it's dumb. And I'm, I'm going to let that go. Verse 27. What says the end of verse 26? Why are you fearful? Are you have little faith that he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. The men marveled, saying, what manner of this, that even the winds and the sea obey him. When we get to Mark 4, we might get into what means to marvel at something. There's a great study in what men marvel at versus what they should marvel at, what God tells you to not marvel at, you know, marvel not that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. There's all these great Bible marvels uh, that um, it's a fun little study. Uh, verse uh, says, and come to the, when he was come into the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. Now, I have looked up these Gergesene fellows, and I can't find any mention of them outside of this verse. Uh, when you go to the, the, the corresponding passage in uh, uh, Mark 4 or Mark 5, it's called uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Gadara, Gadarenes, Gadarenes. And because uh, it's the maniac of Gadara, and um, it's the same patch of ground, but I can't find any reference to these guys. I don't know who they are. They're just 
This is just what that neighborhood is called. So it's called that country. Um, it was coming to the other side of the country. The Gerasians there met him too, possessed with devils, coming out of tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass that way. Now, this same story is told again in Mark 5, uh, but only in Mark 5, only one of the guys has mentioned, and that, that's that's odd. I don't, I don't, I don't really know what that, why that is. Um, but here in Mark, I'm sorry, here in Matthew 8, we can see uh, so, some of the some of the uh, hallmarks of, of devilment and devil position that you see even spelled out even more specifically in Mark 5. But uh, you see here uh, it says they uh, they met they met him too possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fear so that no man might pass by that way. So here you see with people that are obsessed with devils, what you have is an obsession. I'm sorry, people that are possessed with devils. What you have here is an obsession with death and graves and tombs. All that stuff is a symptom of, of at least devilish influence, if not devilish possession. Have you considered the culture you live in? Before I got saved, I was uh, really into horror movies and really into darkness and really into death and really into uh, all that sort of stuff. Why? Because I was a child of the devil and the works of my father I would do. And um, I will say that that, that 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 stuff is not good. I'll say that stuff's not good for you. I'll say that if you if you find yourself being fascinated with death, you know all all the, all the great pagan cultures of the world, uh, the Egyptian uh, culture, the uh, Aztec culture, the uh, Roman Catholic culture, they are all death cults. They're all obsessed with death, and they're all they're all full of devils. And I don't know any other way to put it. Uh, but here we hear so these guys here that are coming out of the tombs. They've been hanging out in a graveyard, and they've been they, they're they're uh, they're obsessed with death. They're obsessed with graves. They're obsessed with tombs, and they're also fierce. Fierceness is another attribute uh, that's given to to to, uh, to people that are that are possessed with devils or affiliated with devils. Uh, these fellows were attacking people. Apparently, apparently the gra- this graveyard they were hanging out in was near something that people had to pass by. There was a, a road there or something. And these guys had run out of the, you know, run behind the bushes, behind the bushes or something, and jump on people. And you see in Mark five that these guys, the, the, the townspeople, had even tried chaining up at least one of these guys, but the, they could break the chains because supernatural strength and fierceness and obsession with death are all symptoms uh, of, of devilish influence. Fierceness. But you know, look, 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 okay, let's look at let's look at Second Timothy three. I submit to you. Well, let, let me let me let me uh, let me connect some dots here before I before I say this. Second Timothy three. So we know that one of the attributes given to people who are possessed with devils is fierceness. The Bible specifically calls out that that and fierceness is not the same thing as zeal. Uh, fierceness is, is fierceness. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. So, it is, it is the attribute of people that are doing business with devils. It is also an attribute of perilous times, and so the case could be made, and I think it's a it's a it's it's a case worth considering uh, that just like the the first advent of Jesus Christ when he came to this earth, that when he got here, uh, one of the one of the marks of the of, of society was that they were they were marked by devilment. You could make the case that the same condition um, exists at his second advent. It's marked by people. Uh, that are do, that are taking on the doctrines of devils, that are people people that are taking on the attributes of devils, people that are that are praying to devils. All that stuff is was going on then. All that stuff is going on now, and you can trace a line going starting back at the, I would say the early part of the 20th century or the latter part of the 19th century, and you have this rise in spiritualism, seances, and all this stuff sort of thing in uh, in Western culture, starting in England with the Fox sisters and come over here to America and all that stuff. And and that led to the seances, and that led to uh, 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 spiritualism, and that led to all this other stuff. 
And then that stuff is just rolled right into the, to the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. In the 60s, uh, you, you had all these, uh, I mean, the 50s, you had movies that were monster movies. They were horror movies like Dracula or, or Frankenstein or whatever. Uh, but those weren't a cult based uh, scare horror movies. Those weren't movies in which devils and foul spirits and the un- and the undead and that sort of well, maybe the mummy. Okay, I, I, I grant you that one. But even the mummy comes out of a you know a pagan death cult of a culture. But my point is, is, is in the in, in the in the I would say so that so so you have the spiritualism in the twenties. You have. Um, Seances and stuff in the forties. You have uh, twenty years later from that, you you have a big uh, uptick in, uh, you know, the, the the Church of Satan gets founded in sixty nine, and and uh, a Rosemary's Baby. Uh, you know, all, all these movies come out that that where the the uh, the devil first of all is portrayed as being extremely powerful and wily, and 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 almost a sympathetic character. Um, but you also have an uptick in movies where the the antagonists are unclean spirits, or devils, or or demons, or or or, or, or the you know the ghosts, spirits, spooks, that sort of thing, uh, way more than before. And so what I'm saying is that from the beginning of the 20th century, latter half of the night, back part of the 19th century, early 20th century, you've got at this point in American society, you've got 120 years or so solid of increasing amount of devilment in your popular culture, in your popular entertainment. And I think that has led to an increase in actual devil activity, which is why you can have really strange things go on, like happen every cotton picking day in your country. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the way to say it. Your, your country, uh, I, I sometimes wonder if I could get a time machine and I could bring somebody that I greatly admire from history. I, let's say I could bring Robert E. Lee forward. To from eighteen, let's see, he died in eighteen seventy. Uh, so I would bring, I'd, you know, obviously pick him up then. I'd pick him up after the war, uh, and I would bring him forward to now. And I don't even know how I would begin to explain to him. I mean, he was an engineer. There, there are there are mechanical improvements, there are electronic improvements that I could probably explain to him enough to where he could understand the basic premise, at least enough like you do. I mean, you use things every day in your life that you have no idea how they work. You just know that they do. So he could, he's a smart enough fella. Uh, he could get his engineering brain around the basics of it enough to trust the, you know, so he could get by. But how do you take somebody like that? And, and, and it came out of that culture and that's just that, that point in history. And how do you explain to him how quickly, uh, how quickly uh, things are, things are falling apart? We, we were at Walmart last night. I'm going to get back to this text here. We were at Walmart last night, and this this uh, this group of young kids came out of the door, and I understand the teenage rebellion, and I understand uh, they're go- looking for shock value, and they don't really know who they are, and their brains aren't fully formed, and they're dumb as a box of rocks. And so I get that, but that it seems like, and I'm, I, I graduated high school in the 90s, so I know a little bit about this because the goth movement was big when I was... Uh, uh, in high school and everything, and but here we are, you know, a generation, two, gener- two gener- generation and a half, two generations past uh, my generation, and uh, it ju- it is so much darker, so much quicker. So these 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 kids came out of Walmart, and I've I've got I've got kids these kids' age, and the guy was all dressed up in black, and he was all his eyeliner looked like a ghoul or a zombie or some such thing. He looked like an idiot. I'm, I'm sure when he left the house, he thought he looked really fierce, and I thought he I'm sure he thought he looked really. You know, but he's going for shock value, and and, and 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 there's other things going on. These girls that were with him were, you know, barely dressed. Uh, you could see their underwear. You could see anything else you wanted to see, uh, and they're you know 16, 17, 15 years old. And but not not only are they you know dressed like that, not only are they dressed like it's Halloween. Um, you know, their hair is all different kind of rainbow colors, and they got big pace spacers in their ears, and they got you know hooks in their face and all that sort of stuff. And so if, if I, I think if you took somebody from the 1860s and you would say, and you would say, Hey, look at this generation we have now, they would look at that would they would say devils. They would say, these are people 
who are doing Congress with devils. The others are people who are, are keeping fellowship with devils, and it's influencing their behavior, and it manifests itself, itself in a, a, the tendency to self-harm. It manifests itself in a, in a spiritual deadness, and it manifests itself in an obsession with death and with graves and with, 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 with darkness. And so those kids will, assuming they live to adulthood, they will probably put away some of that stuff. But every generation that, that goes down that road goes a little further than the generation before. And so then the next generation has to be even more outrageous for the shock value and for the rebellion and just get further and further and further down this road. And I don't know two, three generations. I don't know what we're doing. I, I, you know, you could go to Walmart and you could see you maybe. Who knows? You could see a guy with his teeth filed down into points eating a baby in the parking lot. Oh, that had never happened. You know, 20 years ago, people told me that pedophilia would never be mainstream. And yet here we are. Devils. I'm telling you, devils. America has a sin problem. America has a devil problem. And it manifests itself in a hundred different ways. And you know, if you've got a Bible, you know what to look for. You look for people that are fierce. Look for people that are uh, supernaturally strong. I'm sure you've seen these videos. These guys come running at the cops. And a cop hits him with a taser. And, and the guy hits him with pepper spray. And the guy just keeps on coming. And they shoot him three, four, five, six times. And the guy's still coming. That's not natural human behavior. There's something else going on. And it's going on all across our society. And our country needs Jesus Christ, and our country needs the gospel to be preached, and the gospel and, and, and the country needs Christians who will have a backbone and will refuse to play along with the stupidness just to be polite. That's what they need. Matthew 8. I'll tell you, man, it, it, it is, it is, uh, I have talked to people, I've witnessed to people, I've dealt with people that, uh, I am convinced had unclean spirits in them. I'm convinced of it. Uh, their behavior was erratic. They're, uh, and I've, I've, some of these stories I've probably told before. One of the nice things about becoming an old, you know, half seen all guy is you can tell the same stories over and over again and you're having a good time and other people just are tolerating you. And that's, you know, that's how it works. But, uh, uh, we, we had this, there was this girl I, was, I knew in high school and uh, we were hanging out and such as all that. And she was messing, and I wasn't saved. So I had no spiritual discernment. I mean, I grew up in a voodoo culture in Louisiana, but, I, but I, you know, I just, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't just, I was I had no, if someone came to me with a spiritual problem, I had no advice to give them because I, I didn't know anything. I certainly did not have a Bible, did not have the Holy Spirit, did not have any understanding. So this girl was messing around with devils. I'm looking back, I realized that's what she was doing. She was messing around with devils and she had a familiar spirit. Uh, that actually would come to her in a dream and uh, and would reveal future events to her. And these future events had come true, and so she put a great amount of stock in this in this spirit. So she was having these dreams, and she was having a hard time remembering them. And so what she had done is she bought a tape recorder, and she would play this. She would hit record on this tape recorder when she went to sleep, and or I'm sorry, when she she'd wake up from her dream and she would hit record on this tape recorder and she would talk into the tape recorder before because you know you, you wake up and you, the dream kind of gets away from you after coming you can't remember you were terror scared to death a minute ago and you can't remember what it was so she would record into this voice recorder um i'm watching a goat go by sorry easily distracted she would have this tape recorder she would record her dream before she forget it that way when it came true she would say oh look i got this so she brings me this tape one time. And she goes, I want to know what you think about this. And she played this tape for me. And I could hear her voice on the tape recorder. And I could hear another voice on the tape recorder. It sounded like a man standing directly behind her, talking in her ear. And telling her what to say in this tape recorder. So all that stuff's real. All that stuff's legit. And you're walking around in a world that is a generation and a half, two generations down the road from what that girl was doing. Fierce and supernaturally strong 
and obsessed with death. Matt, what did I say? Matthew 8, we're going to get back to Mark. We may not get very far, but we'll get we'll get back to Mark. Matthew 8, verse 29. Uh, some really came in the interest of Two men possessed with devils come out of the tombs. Verse 29, Behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Now, there's a lot packed into that little question there, okay? So, um, once again, the devils recognize him on sight, right? And uh, they understand that not only is uh, torment in their future, but they understand that Jesus Christ will be the one who, who facilitates this torment. You know, it's hard to say. Uh, mankind is not the only player on the stage, okay? You got to understand that. There is a whole host of other entities and, and things going on all around us that God in His wisdom has decided to make us not privy to. And those things have their own history and those things have their own backstory and those things have their own um, relationship in regards to Jesus Christ as far as it, how they regard Him and what their interactions with Him are. Having said all that, they, these guys, like I said, these guys understood that in their future, at some point in the future, the liberty they have here to run around and, and, and inhabit people and, and terrorize the population, that liberty will be removed and they will be taken to a place where they will be tormented. And they understand that that's coming and that Jesus Christ is going to be the facilitator of that. And they also seem to have some sort of uh, insight into the, the, uh, the timeline uh, of earthly history because they knew that that time was coming, but they knew that that time wasn't yet. And they asked Jesus, Are you, have you come to torment us before our time? Once again, you are walking in your Bible, you're walking in the middle of a conversation that has possibly been going on for thousands of years. And a drama that has been, you get a little peek behind the curtain of a drama that has been playing out since man left the garden or maybe even before. Wild, wild stuff. Uh, yeah. Verse 30. And they were a good way off from them and a, high, uh, and, and a herd of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou canst cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. He said to them, Go. And when they come out, they went into the herd of swine. Behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. So if all you have is Matthew 8, it doesn't necessarily make sense. Well, for, let, let me back a little bit. So, not only did Israel have lepers run around, which they're not supposed to have, not only was was everybody and his brother sick, which they weren't supposed to be, not only were devils doing business uh, around there, which they weren't supposed to be, but they were raising pigs, for crying out loud. I mean, those, these things are expressly forbidden under Leviticus 11, but here they are. And I don't know if they were raising them to eat them. I'm, I don't know any, any any other reason why you would raise a pig if not to eat it. Uh, I'm looking at this goat that's, uh, I don't know if you guys can hear that. She, she's right up against where we're at. Hey, how's it going? Okay. I don't know why I ever had these goats, to be honest with you. I, they, they're really good at keeping the yard cleaned up, but other than that, they're kind of useless. I don't eat them, so. No, you're not coming in here. So, yes, this might be the only street preaching Bible believing podcast that is occasionally inter interrupted by goat activity. Should probably put that on a business card or something. So the the, the Jews are not supposed to have pigs because unless you're gonna eat that pig, there's no reason to have pigs. And and I've heard people say, well, they were selling them to the Roman soldiers. You don't know that, but you do know by out of Mark five that there was two thousand pigs, which seems to me to be a lot of pigs. But if all you have is Mark 8, then you don't know. It's hard to figure out, at least it was for me, uh, how two guys, with presumably a devil each, could inhabit 2,000 pigs. Excuse me. And these aren't wild pigs because there's a guy tending to them. Uh, but it's also interesting to me that these devils... Uh, get, your brain, get your brain around this, right? Uh, I, have, I have a stick shift car that I'm currently trying to resurrect. And a stick shift is my preferred mo mode of, of, of transportation. Um, my children uh, have expressed very little desire in learning how to drive a stick shift, but I know how to operate a stick shift. And so these devils 
know how to operate a human body. They know how to go into a human body and pull the levers and flip the switches to make that body move around and do things. They know how to operate that body to get supernatural strength out of it and supernatural endurance. They know how to how to make that body do things that harms it. Right? They know how to drive a human body. But not only do they not they know how to drive a human body, they know how to drive a pig body. And like I said, there's a whole history here that we're not necessarily privy to all the details on. But I, I think it's at least possible that these guys know how to operate a body because they used to have one. And I won't speculate much, much past that except to say that I can't come up with any, any other explanations of how these guys are so, so effortlessly able to, uh, to operate a body. But anyway, so how do these two guys, how do two guys with presumably two devils inhabit an entire herd of swine? Well, you find out in Mark 5 that at least one of these guys had, quote, many devils, and we know that, we know that it's 2,000 pigs. So, so now think about this, though. Um, so God, let me back up a little. God is, generally speaking, God is very much in favor of property rights. I won't so far to say I'm a libertarian. I won't so far to say, go to say that God is a libertarian. Uh, but I will say that God believes in property rights because the reason you know God believes in property rights because he has a rule that says thou shalt not steal. And if, there are, and, and if you could steal something, that means it belongs, definitely belongs to someone other than you. Because if everything belonged to everybody, there would be no sense in having a prohibition against stealing. So God believes that certain things are yours and they don't belong to anybody else. God believes certain patches of land are yours and don't belong to anybody else. There's all sorts of rules on the Old Testament regime about property and land and what you can and cannot do with it. And one of those things you can't do is you just can't take other people's stuff. God's, God's against it. And, and so God's against it, so God is in favor of property. But here does this guy here, whoever he is, the pig farmer dude, he has a bunch of pigs, and God has no qualms about destroying this man's entire herd of swine, costing him untold thousands of dollars, presumably. And Jesus didn't blink an eye doing it. I mean, I mean, it's just a little regard for the property rights of the man who had animals that God had told him not to have. And so, so the reason that is, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do a study at some point about this about about the the the, the, the uh, relationship that exists between righteousness and freedom, and without righteousness, uh, liberty turns into lawlessness because. You can say, well, you don't have the, you know, you have the right to do whatever you want. Well, then you turn people all who are godless and God haters, you turn them loose and let them do anything they want to do. You find out what's really in their hearts and what they, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get into this right now because I, I'm still putting it together, but there's a relationship there. And so the idea is that even though you have the right, quote unquote, to do whatever you want, you don't have, in God's eyes, you don't have the right to do that, which is wrong. You're not at liberty to do that which is evil. You're at liberty to do with that which is good. And when God saves you and God gives you liberty, Christian life is full of liberty. He is not, he's not giving, giving you freedom so you can sin. He's giving you freedom so you can do right. And a free people that are also moral people, and you can, you can see this early American history, a free people that are also moral people will do right. And it'll be a blessing, and 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 you know, I think uh, I'm, I'm not. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna do. It. But so God is is more concerned with with obedience to His rules than your rights, because from His perspective, you do not have the right to do wrong. He didn't give you liberty so you could sin. Verse thirty four. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coast. It is strange to me, although not entirely surprising, I guess. Sometimes you think, sometimes you say something strange, and you think about it for a second. You know that that, that, that checks out. So here you have people that they this the, the whole city comes out, and um, these people didn't care. Now, again, about it, these people, these two fellows that came out of the tombs, they were a public nuisance. People had tried to chain up at least one of them. People had stopped going by the graveyard because these fellows would run out of the bushes and jump on them, right? And so these guys are a public nuisance that no one apparently can do anything about. And so you would think that the, the, the townspeople would be glad that there's no longer a public nuisance. And you think they would be glad, for these guys' sake, that they were delivered. You'd think that just, just general human compassion. I mean, you knew a guy 
that was hooked on crack or something and you saw him get delivered, you'd be happy for him. Even if you didn't have any personal stake, even if you, it, you'd be glad for him, right? Well, these fellows that got delivered from, from, from hanging out naked in a graveyard and cutting themselves and moaning and crying and tearing chains apart, these guys got delivered from a lot. And you'd think that the townspeople will be glad for themselves because they're no longer had to worry about being attacked by weirdos in the graveyard. And they'll also be glad because they, um, because these guys have, have experienced great deliverance. Uh, but they didn't care about that. They didn't care that these guys had been delivered. They didn't care they didn't have to worry about being attacked. They didn't care that, that a literal miracle had happened in their town. But they did care that they no longer had ready access to, to ham sandwiches. So what's what, what's the application there? Well, I'll tell you something, man. We go down to uh, you know the, the the city square and we'll preach, and we'll talk about. Sometimes we'll give our testimony. And my partner, the legendary Darnell G. Robinson, will give his testimony about how he was saved on March the fifth, the year two thousand, while in solitary confinement at the Woodbine County Jail for crimes he had committed against society. And he'll talk about how a person came in and preached to him the self same gospel that he's preaching to them now. And that it delivered him, and it saved him, and it rescued him. He's not the man he was, and God's given him everlasting life, and God gives, has given him a sound mind, and God has fixed his life, and put his brain back together, and given him happiness, and joy, and life, and life more abundantly. And you would think, if nothing else, people would be glad for him. But generally speaking, they're not. Generally speaking, uh... They want us to depart out of their coasts. <laughs> and that's just how, that's the way the ball bounces, man. That's the way the cookie crumbles. Now back to Mark 2. So God comes, Jesus Christ comes, does a literal miracle. Hey, man, you got to leave. You can't be hanging right here. You can't have that sort of stuff going around right here. Now we can't get ham sandwiches. What in the world, man? What do we ever do to you? Mark 2, verse 1, we can start why we're not going to get everything done. We're not going to get very far into, into, uh, into Mark 2 here because I, I chased too many rabbits. Verse 1, after some days, I'm sorry, and again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and I, I would say that the after some days is you know, the last 45 minutes of this podcast. Um, everything in Matthew 8 is after some days. Um, and it was known as he was in a house, and straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And it came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy that was born of four. I heard a very irreverent comedian once say, I would be sick of the palsy too. Anyway, they can't get to Jesus, quote, because of the press. And, and that's a cute little pun about, you know, that still applies today. You know, the media used to be called the press because it was a, a print media. It was, you know, printing press. And that was an invention that uh, that truly changed the world. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but once upon a time, uh, every book on earth was handwritten. It, it's, it, I have thousands of books, I think, probably. And uh, at least several, several, several hundred. And in my life, I've read, no doubt, thousands upon thousands. And all of them that I've read, out of all those thousands, all of them have been pr- printed with a printing press of some kind. And I read, I've never read a handwritten book, I don't think. And uh, But once upon a time, if you found a book, it was written by hand. And if you had two copies, it was because somebody had written it down twice. But this is not this kind of press. I, I, would, I would wax eloquent forever about my love for Mr. Gutenberg and his, his, his great accomplishment, but... Uh, this is not the kind of press, and uh, this is a crowd. There's a crowd of people. That Jesus is at somebody's house in Capernaum, and there and, and there's so many people in there uh, hearing him preach that the, the people that need to get to him cannot. And um, verse four, when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they'd broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. I'm going to finish on this note. I don't know that I've ever uh, been desperate enough to get help from God, that I would do, that I've even contemplated what these fellows did. I get that the roof, you know, when, when they say they tore the roof out, it's not like the, you know, shingles and, and, and you know, and, and particle, or uh, plywood and, uh, and, you know, felt paper and, uh, 
it's not a modern roof. I get that it's, you know, it's thatch. I get that it's, it's, you know, it's a flat roof and there's access to it. I get all that, but still, um, these were men, I, I, you would think that they would, I don't know. I mean, they really thought outside the box, you know, they tore a roof off the fellow's house and, and lowered their friend down with, with ropes of some kind. You see it in, 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 uh, in, in Matthew nine. And, um, like I said, I don't know that I've ever been that desperate to get help from God that I would I would say I'm going to go to these extremes. I'm going to think outside the box. I'm going to do whatever it takes. And these guys that were doing this were not doing this for their own sake. They were doing it for the sake of their friend. And there's all kind of applications how you ought to be able to, you ought to try to get your friends to Jesus. If they need Jesus, you need to try to get them to Jesus. You ought to try to get them anyway by hook or by crook. You ought to. You ought to pay the price. You ought to inconvenience yourself. Yeah, there's all those great applications, but in a very practical sense, I mean, I've got a friend here that's sick, you know, and and I know Jesus up there healing people, and I want him to be healed so bad. I have so much care and compassion for that fellow, and I know Jesus Christ can heal him because Jesus Christ has healed other people. That I'm going to, it just, it just would not even occur to me to tear the roof off the fellow's house and and lower him down. And when Jesus saw their faith, verse 5, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. I'm just going to mention that it is their faith, not the, necessarily the faith of the fellow in the, in, the, uh, in the stretcher. It's the faith of the men that said, if we can get this fellow in front of Jesus, Jesus will help him. And Jesus was impressed by that. And, uh, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Oh boy, did Jesus open up a can of worms there. And we're going to stop there because that is that deserves its own thing. We're going to backtrack a little bit next time. Um, man, what a thing, huh? What a Bible. All right, thank you for listening, guys, all four of you. And uh, appreciate the, the uh, uh, consistency that you've had in, in listening to me rattle on about God knows what. And uh, thank you for listening. This is Michael. This has been the Street Preacher's Corner Podcast. And I will see you on the other side.